Hang on. Oh, it's running. Um, hi everybody. So, a uh, bit of a change of location today. Uh, it's been just over a week since my airplane crashed and I got this surprise vacation to the middle of the Pacific Islands. <laughs> this is the last time that I book a flight with Malaysian Airlines, everybody. But hey, it's all about that vlog life, bro. So, uh, status update. Still stranded and running dangerously low on consumables. Hey, excellent news. So here I was over on the east side of the island fighting a monkey over a coconut and, uh, well, I lost, but the good news is that I saw this washed ashore. It's a TV from 1993, just lying on the beach. Gosh, you'd be surprised all the garbage you can find in the Pacific Ocean. So anyway, I think that this might be my salvation. <laughs> you hear that, you stupid primate? So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we can use this TV to look up a way off this island. Okay, let's go to YouTube, the source of all information. DIY radio transmitter and search. Aha, top result. Let's watch. Videos are pretty commonplace nowadays, like the remote for this RC car, but this technology has a rich and interesting history. The first remote controlled drone was a miniature boat made by the Serbian inventor Nikola Tesla and demonstrated in 1898. It was controlled using a spark gap radio, which was designed by the Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi years earlier. A spark gap radio is a radio that uses a high voltage spark of electricity to generate the radio frequencies used to communicate. What I have here is a modern version of a spark gap radio which operates on the same principle that Marconi's and Tesla's radios did. Now these radios are very primitive by today's standards and they're only capable of sending out pulses of radio energy, so the only form of information that you could send using this technique is Morse code. The basics of what's happening here is this, when you depress the switch it creates a high voltage burst of electricity across the spark gap, and by adding an antenna to one side of the spark gap, it generates radio frequencies which can be transmitted over them thar hills. Ah, the sweet smell of radio frequencies, just like Marconi used to make. Hey, hey Dayton buddy, you there? Yeah, you're breathing in ozone, that's uh, not too safe. What? Dude, I've been breathing that stuff in all morning. Oh man. Say, Plasma Channel, you know a thing or two about plasma, right? Eh, I mean, you know, some would say that. Perfect. Well, what do you say we work together on this? Actually, Dayton, I think that's a great idea. You're a brilliant engineer, and I have a channel that focuses on high voltage, so I kind of feel like that's a good marriage of two ideas. So here's what I propose. You build the small-scale proof-of-concept model and work out all the kinks, because I know you can, and I'll go ahead and scale it up to a slightly more industrial sized. What do you say? Great. While you get started on that, I'll go into how these spark gap radios actually work. As it turns out, any arc of electricity is capable of generating radio frequencies, though generally random discharges of electrical energy create wide bandwidth radio energy, meaning that it's all over the frequency spectrum. This electrical noise isn't particularly useful on its own, but if we want to transmit it over a large distance, we would use an antenna. Antennas operate on the principles of electromagnetism. What we have here is called a monopole antenna. It's simply a wire that doesn't go anywhere. Just a simple rod of metal. What will happen is that the charges in the circuit will rush up the antenna, and as they do, it'll create a magnetic field. It's been well established for a long time that moving charges, or electrical currents, generate a magnetic field as they move through a conductor. Once the charges become high enough, the sparks will jump across the gap, and all of those charges will rush away from the antenna. 
If we let this process go, we see charges oscillating up and down the length of the antenna, making alternating magnetic fields. If we hold a receiving antenna near the transmitting antenna, what we get is the same process in reverse. The alternating magnetic fields from the transmitter cause charges to oscillate in the receiver, which we can see on the oscilloscope, but these signals are inherently random. That might not seem particularly useful, but this is how the earliest radios operated. Marconi's earliest radio worked a lot like this. The high voltage was generated by an induction coil, which I've replaced with a flyback transformer from a tube TV, since they're practically the same thing. Marconi would have used a solenoid and Leyden jar condenser as the inductive and capacitive oscillator. Since I'm from the future, I use a ZVS driver. On the input, I've placed a telegram switch, so now, every time the switch is pressed, we get a radio signal, which disappears once the switch is released. Information could be transmitted using this technology as Morse code, a series of long and short radio pulses. For instance, if I wanted to send the emergency signal SOS, which sounds like this, I would type this on the telegram key. Which on the oscilloscope, we can clearly make out which pulses are short and which ones are long. But this radio only works over a very short distance. If we wanted to transmit over a longer distance, well, I'll let Jay over at Plasma Channel tell you about that. Well, the obvious solution to broadcasting radio further is to use more power. But even though the brute force method does work and works well, it's not always the most practical approach. Instead, we can make our antennas more efficient through two main methods. First, making your antenna as tall as possible. You see, without the century's worth of knowledge that we have now, Marconi had to go with what he found worked best. And what he found worked best was attaching his antenna to either a kite or to a tower to get it as tall as possible. Talk about ingenuity. And second, which is related to the height, is have a resonant sized antenna, meaning the antenna length should be equivalent to half of the wavelength of the frequency at which you're transmitting at. This is how you efficiently propagate radio waves using an antenna, and it's also the same process with which Tesla coils create resonant voltage rise and make big sparks out the top. Now that you have a grasp at how radio works, I've attached the permanent extendable five foot antenna, making the spark gap radio complete. You can see all the components from the spark gap to both of the ignition coils, the batteries, which is the ultimate power source, the telegraph switch, and even the control box, which controls the radio's audible frequency from 1 to 17 kilohertz. Okay, no more theory, it's time for a serious outdoor test. It may not look it, but I am surrounded by all four sides with RF shielding. Super cool, Morse code at 33 feet. But this transmitter can still do better, so I'm cranking up the power in an underground parking garage. Still using the same radio, and both the transmitter and the radio are grounded. These tests were done in the middle of the night, and you can see all five pixels of me placing the radio. Now the parking garage is a dead zone for AM radio waves, so the only thing you're going to hear is from the transmitter. It works! Okay, let's see what this thing's made of. Let's push this transmitter to the max. I've opened up the spark app to the point that it barely wants to fire. Will this transmit 100 feet? So we're able to transmit radio out to at least 100 feet, using nothing more than just a spark gap with an antenna attached to it. This is the original spark gap radio. This is how radio used to work. Now it's one thing to transmit radio waves using a spark gap transmitter like this, but honestly it's completely pointless to transmit radio if you don't have an accurate method for detecting radio waves at a long distance. And back in the 1800s, they didn't have things as convenient as a pocket radio. So, they had to rely on a slightly more primitive method. 
Of course, nobody had oscilloscopes in the 1800s, so... So, how then were Marconi and Tesla able to receive these radio signals? Well, at first, they used one of these. This little piece of technology is known as a coherer. I made this by grinding down some iron, any ferrous metal will work, and put it between two conductors in a plastic tube. The iron filings have a very high resistance when left alone, but exhibit a very interesting property when a radio signal is detected. As you can see, the LED turns on now, and if I turn off the radio, it stays on. What's happening is that the strong field being made by the transmitter is causing the iron filings to cohere, and as a result, the resistance drops dramatically, allowing the LED to turn on. Once cohered, the iron filings will stay cohered until a tap from a hammer decoheres them. Years later, AM, or Amplitude Modulated Radio, would come into popularity. Essentially what we have here is an Amplitude Modulated Radio. If I wanted to send out a 10 Hz signal like this, the radio, by its very nature, modulates it with a high frequency noise. If I wanted that 10 Hz signal back without the noise, I would want a circuit like this, an AM radio demodulator. To demodulate a signal, I built a three-stage circuit. This is how it works. Come on, move it! I'm like this close to dehydration. You know what, just fast forward. <laughs> to demonstrate the range of this radio, I have placed both the transmitter and the receiver on this table with nothing in between them. Simply the transmitting and receiving antenna. So when I go over to the transmitter side and press a few pulses on the key, we see the LED turn on from across the table. If I wanted to, I could replace this LED with a relay so I can turn on and off bigger loads, such as an incandescent light bulb or a washing machine. Nikola Tesla would even use the same technology to instruct his remote-controlled boat to take either a left or a right, depending on how many pulses it detected. And this circuit here is specifically designed for frequencies up to 100 Hz. Of course, demodulation circuits in the future would be sensitive to much higher frequencies, such as audible frequencies, so that instead of turning on and off a light bulb, it could oscillate a speaker. Of course, there is one last thing to talk about, and that's the inevitable downfall of the Spark Gap Radio. So everything seemed to be going pretty good for the Spark Gap Radio as a new technology. Everybody and their mother wanted one. And that's the problem. Since Spark Gaps take up the entire frequency spectrum, only one could be operated in an area at a time, and the congestion became epic. That is, until this little guy. A vacuum tube. These were the first ever high frequency switches that could control the flow of electrons flying between two plates in a vacuum. This technology allowed for radios to reach the megahertz range, and finally, everything was starting to look like a proper radio. As tube radios took over the market, as well as making radio signals that don't interfere with other radios, the FCC, along with other international regulatory bodies, put regulations in place that essentially made it illegal to operate a sport gap trans- <laughs> Enough of that video. It's time for me to get off this island. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm gonna need a piece of driftwood, some electrical tape. Oh, take that. Ha! I did it! One radio, made entirely out of things I can find in the ocean and sneak by the TSA. <laughs> oh, with this thing I'm going to be able to call an airplane for miles. Well, I'm sure one's got to come by eventually. I see it! I see it! It's an airplane! My salvation! <laughs> come on! Quick! Before it's grab doodles out of here! Oh, finally! I'm saved! Officer Rickard from the uh, FCC. We received your transmission. It's against FCC rules to operate a smart gap transmitter. You're 
Clearly a danger to society. Come what? with me. No, I'm Eminence Sin. Monkey, save me! Wow. Who the heck is that guy? Oh, hey, I see you're still here. Well, since I have you, could I convince you to perhaps check out Plasma Channel or subscribe to Blueprint? And of course, as always, thanks for watching.